All right, guys, I thought I would do this video in support of my segment for the Expert Council show that went out to, that's going out today. It actually hasn't gone out yet, but it will in just a, about an hour from the time I'm shooting this video. This is the, uh, it, they call them Chinese python snake beans, Indian python snake bean, et cetera. I think there may be some reality to that. I also think there is just some marketing going on and creating creative names. But th these, the seed for this stuff came from Baker Creek. Uh, they do still have it in their catalog. Again, listed as Indian steak bean, but it's also listed as sold out, at least as of right now. This was a plant I was in and out on through the year. You can see some of these leaves, that that look, that yellowing look, and you can see there's nothing really wrong with the plant because the rest of it just looks beautiful. But I had a lot of leaves that kind of looked like that throughout the hot hot period of the summer. And I don't know if it was drought stress even with irrigation or if it was just the brutal heat that we had this year. But this is supposed to love heat, and it didn't. I'm just going to say it didn't love heat at all. And I really thought I was going to lose the vine. I had two vines here and one elsewhere. Very poor germination. And what I've learned so after uh, doing this this year is the seeds of these are very hard. They should be scarified, which means you take like a little bit of uh, uh, sandpaper, emery cloth or something, and kind of put some some uh texture on the outside of the seed break that uh casing a little bit and then soak them in water overnight and i think your germination rate would go way up uh what happened though was and here's the second vine what's left of it it's it, it, goose rage so i came out here and half of it was dying on me and i wondered why and it looked like somebody had sh shredded it and somebody had it's just it was gooses so gooses will commit goose rage um i'm starting to look at this crop and seeing you know, one of the food security crops that we've kind of lost touch with that the rest of the world, at least the Asian part of the world, is not. Different varieties of this plant called different things grow everywhere from southern China all the way into the northern African climate. Uh, like I said, some of them seem to have this pattern on them. And these are the ones that are marketed more as an Indian snake bean. And some, even when they're large, they're more, they look more like that right there. So what's amazing about this plant is you look at that and think of this is actually a gourd and you would think, well, whoa, once it's that big, it's probably not good to eat. That's, that's fine to eat. They get a lot bigger than that. That thing might be able to get all the way to the ground. Now that's the one I'm planning on saving for seed this year. So if it gets much longer, I'm probably going to maybe tie it up that way or something to keep the goose rage from coming back and ruining my seed crop. This, you would cut this off. And you could let it get a little bit bigger before you did. You'd chop this up. You could either make it in thin long strips or just cross cut it. And you would stir fry that. You use it just like green beans and it kind of tastes like green beans. This would be another one that's about the right size. I may pick a couple of these smaller ones tonight and cook them with dinner. Fried with peppers is a very traditional way uh, for them to be used. They don't seem to have any real pest pressure at all. Nothing uh, put any real pest pressure on it. You can see blossoms up there, but they're a little hard to get close. I think they have an amazing flower. They kind of make me think of like something that would be used in a Star Trek episode of some strange plant that you might find on some strange world. But, you know, they grow right here on uh, good old terra firma. And these things, once they start producing and they just... So what happened is in the middle of summer, I would get fruit set like this right here, like this little one here. And it would get maybe an inch longer and then it would just die. It just wouldn't grow out. Now, as you can see, I've got them setting everywhere and they're growing. And this is, that one's not gonna grow. That's exactly what happened to like all of them. See how that is? Now, I don't know if that was just a lack of uh, fertility. It could have been if they weren't pollinated. Because I want to show you that flower again and talk to you a little bit about the pollination issue here. So, if you look at this flower, it's a, a pretty big flower, but it's a very tiny kind of, it's called the business end of the flower right there, right? And if you look at that, that doesn't really look like something that would be that interesting to a bee, and it's not. These are pollinated by moths, and my understanding is most of the moths that pollinate this plant are nocturnal. So the other issue with my climate being here in North Central Texas is maybe the moths that are necessary to pollinate this plant just weren't active in the heat of my summer or even the end of my early spring. On top of that, we had a really weird 
year and a half, almost two years, 20 months of drought. And right now I have wild plants growing that usually grow in the spring and they're growing in the fall. Uh, certain, um, like wild hyacinth and uh, camas that grow wild on my property and wild garlics. I never saw any this spring and some of them are now sprouting after the rains that we recently got. So it could have been that the pollinators were simply inactive due to the drought. Because again, this is a, this variety is supposed to be from Southern India. It's supposed to love heat and it, and it just didn't. So I'm not sure why. But based on my performance this year, I will try planting it next spring. But what I'm also gonna do is I'm gonna start fresh plants uh, probably about the beginning of August and then transplant them out after about three weeks to other areas where the first, and see if maybe it's in my climate, it might just be worth making this a fall garden crop. That maybe it just doesn't do well in our, uh, our cause it took a lot of work to keep this plant alive. There was one, there was these leaves that looked diseased that I, I really don't think it's a disease now because again, the plant itself doesn't seem to have any other problems. The other thing was though, I would come out and it would almost look like it was dried out the leaves were completely like, just like they were, like the plant was dying of dehydration, but half the leaves were good and half the leaves were just folded and just almost like they had a blight or something. Like if you've ever seen uh, plants that like, or squash plants when they get hit by vine borers and the leaves just fold up and just like die, that's what it would look like. And watering it wouldn't change it. I'd cut all those leaves off and, and I, I nursed the, the, this vine through and now it's just explosive. So we'll see going into next year if that was something unique to this season, this, this weird drought, super heat wave, all of the stuff we had, or if maybe this is just really for my area, a fall plant. Now, this is the one, and maybe that one too, I might let go over there, that guy there, that I wanna get as much seed as I can this year. These need to get huge before you get seed. And when they get to the point, you can look up some other videos, when they get to the point where they have seed that's ready to harvest, when you cut this open, about a top third of the plant will not have seed and the bottom two thirds will. And they'll have like a red pulp and that pulp is supposed to be usable like tomato paste. And you'll have, you'll have these, they almost again, it's alien looking, like these alien looking sacks of red and you pop the seed out and then you can take that pulp and you can use a pulp. So you get two different food yields if you let them grow large. If I've heard differing things, people say when they're really large, you can just eat the, uh, the peel, the rind, and other people say the rind gets kind of tough. But the people that say the rind gets kind of tough, if you take a peeler, you can just peel like a, like a potato peeler, the rind just comes right off. Taste, again, is supposed to be similar to green bean, somewhere between green bean and, and, and like a zucchini squash with a lot more flavor than a squash. But something that's this productive, this is, again, this is one vine. And I also watched another guy's channel, I think his name was Papa Prepper was the name of his channel. And, uh, he let these things grow as big as they would grow, cut them up, and decided to make pickles out of them. Because, hey, dilly beans are good, right? He picked three and got six quarts of pickles from them. So I, st I, I really believe that there is a lot of crops in the, uh, the third world, if, if you want to call it that, that we need to be investigating, and this seems like one of them. And maybe I need to send this to Joseph Simcox and get his opinion on it. He keeps... He keeps bantering about being on the podcast again, and then, you know, he goes dark again. So, hey, Joseph, if you catch this, chime in below and tell us what you know about this plant.